Yeah, so uh, let's see how amazing it will. But <laughs> so I put a lot of keywords in the title and, and um, I just thought like there's so much happening over the last years in poly and, and, and then the next thing I got in the reviews of our proposal, people said like, yeah, maybe this is, will be very interesting, but some people said maybe it's really way too technical like to, to go very deep into like polyhedral stuff. And so I tried to just pick a couple of gimmicks, um, what, what we did at ETH and then what Michael um, did to kind of illustrate the things we are doing. And we have a lot more technical um, documents and, and like tutorials and stuff if, if you really want to go into all the details. Um, but let me st first start with some kind of motivation what I'm currently working on. And so like there's a large set of applications, not just four in this case, but um, where, where kind of like advanced um, high level loop optimizations may make sense. So these can be physics simulations, weather simulation, um, graphics processing, maybe also machine learning workloads. All those workloads have, have a lot of loop kernels. They are very performance sensitive and they happen to fit into a model which we call the polyhedral framework. And so we are interested in optimizing such kind of applications. Um, one of the applications I work with is the Cosma weather and climate model which has around half a million lines of Fortran code, around 18,000 loops. It's 19 years of um, weather forecast knowledge hard-coded in this Fortran code base, and it's used across Europe, okay? And there are two use cases for the Fortran one. One is we do climate modeling, so every couple of months researchers want to understand how the future will be, and so we run this on, on like large HPC clusters. Um, and the second one is our daily weather forecast in Switzerland. And yeah, as you expect, we care about how the weather will be. And one of the recent advances in, in weather forecasting in Switzerland is that instead of running a weather forecast each hour, now we run each hour 20 weather forecasts. Just because it's very unreliable, and so having 20 data points, then you can get some probabilistic estimates how the weather will be the next day. And for this, we use this Cosmo weather forecast model, okay? It's a regional weather model for this daily weather forecast. It's at high resolution. I didn't put a slide on that thing, but high resolution means one square kilometer. So you can't see like the big mountains in Switzerland. If you look at the one square kilometer resolution, they actually become very small hills. So it's still very, very imprecise and, and we need to be a lot faster, a lot more efficient to actually get very, very high precision weather models. But that's what we run today, one square kilometer um, over Switzerland. And since um, April last year, the Swiss weather model is running on GPUs. So this was a big multi-year, multi-person project um, to give us an around 4.3x speed up over like parallel CPU version. And like with going through new hardware, we actually managed to, to kind of like improve the performance of our weather model by a factor of 20 which allowed us to, to increase this like run 20 runs and get better pre precision forecasts, right? Unfortunately, there's a huge code base and it's a huge financial investment um, to, to offload this to GPUs. The second data point is that unfortunately not all, every country wants to run on GPUs. So we now have multiple code bases, one for NVIDIA GPUs, we are developing one for um, C on Fives, we have another code base that works on CPUs, and then there's an entirely new model developed for which we were gonna be repeating this again. So the question is, can we do some of this automatically with LVM? And so as a very like, brief introduction, we have this polyhedral model. Unfortunately, my PDF slide doesn't illustrate that very well, but the, the, the basic idea here is that we have simple loop nests. Does this work? No, it does not. Uh, like this, where basically um, the control flow of those loop nests is static, so it doesn't depend on data, and the loops go from a lower bound to an upper bound and execute some compute statements. And the observation we want to make here is that um, this multidimensional loop nest is actually um, spanning up in multidimensional vector space where each of the individual iterations is one computation in this loop nest, okay? And then you can perform arbitrary transfer transformations on this vector space and this reflect certain loop transformations. So this is a very high level overview. Um, I don't really go deep into this because I just want to give you an impression of the, some kind of the transformations we need to do. Um, 
Let me first start with some statistics of what we can actually model. So to be more precise, we have 18,093 total loops. Um, around 9,760 of them are actually loops we can model exactly, very precise. We know for each execution of each computational statement which memory location is accessed, okay? There's another around 6,000 loop nests, um, 6,000 loops, where there are certain memory access we don't really understand precisely, but we can approximate them. And there are another 3,000 which we have no idea what they are doing for various reasons. Most often because um, there are function calls we don't understand, there are side effects we can't model. And so this is, I should mention this, this is work done to, together with Sita, so he's at the conference. If you're interested in Haskell or equality saturation, um, he's very happy to talk about that. Um, so yeah, we have around um, 15,000 loops, then we drop a couple of them because we kind of mis mismodel them, and we realized that early, but we kind of still model around two-thirds of this code base. And the largest set of loop nests we model is around 72 loops. Just to give you an idea what, what kind of program this is. It's also to show a little bit off in terms of, terms of like how far we can scale. So we can model all this application. Um, unfortunately, we cannot optimize yet all of it. But we can model around, like optimize around 10% of that application. And I'm gonna show you one transformation that we're doing currently. It's kind of like one of the key transformations um, to get this code fast. And so as I told you, um, we have multiple versions of the code base and that normally looks like this. So there's an open ACC GPU version and then there's a um, original like C CPU version. And one of the transformations that need to be done all over the code base is that originally the code is very easily vectorizable. So all the loops, all innermost loops are parallel, um, but, but not the outermost loops. And so if to run on a GPU, you need cost grain parallelism, so you need to try to put as much parallelism out as possible. And in this example, it's very simple. There's a special version for the GPU case where we pulled out one of the parallel loops. Um, this is one of the more complex loop nests, so I deleted most of the code, but I tried to illustrate the structure of that loop nest. And well, it, what it does, it computes the optimal effect on, on, on a solar layer, but um, the, the, the basic structure of the loop nest is interesting. What you see here and what I kind of just hinted out a little bit is that it's actually an interprocedural optimization. So there's one um, called to this function COTH, um, which basically goes through a parallel loop um, over all the data points. So for you to illustrate, not entirely sure why that's the case, but um, on the weather model, generally what is parallel is anything on the surface. So the different points in the, on the surface are very often entirely independent, but then there are certain dependencies between the different layers going from the bottom to the sky. And, and that's what, what you can see here, that, that basically when we model this gas propagation, we have the one ground dimension, so the second one we, 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 like, we don't have in this test case, but um, is fully parallel, and then we go up into the sky in a sequential loop. And then we get another of different parallel loops, um, left and right, and they are really nice to vectorize that, but they are very bad to run on a GPU. And so obviously what happens in the code base there's a specialized version, again, where one of the parallel loops is pulled out. So now the outer loop is parallel and the inner loop is sequential. Okay? And this is suddenly what runs really, really fast. And so what I want you to take here is that this is a reasonably complex loop nest because it has multiple not perfectly nested loops. It has data dependencies going from here to there that are local to the parallel loop, but that would prevent us to, by, by naively modeling that loop nest, to actually do the, the necessary loop interchanges, and then especially to run the outer loop in parallel. Um, so here, like kind of a little bit like symbolic way, we have an outer sequential loop, we have multiple parallel innermost loops that are only parallel if you are aware that, that all the data dependencies are actually remain within one single iteration of this loop. And so this kind of illustrates that this is actually multiple 
like tens to hundreds lines of code where we kind of propagate all the like, uh, what is it, like wind and then drain and t t temperature, all that stuff is propagated through through the kind of atmosphere, and 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 and, and through with this propagation we get all those dependencies. Interesting, most of the oh, that's another story, but most of this stuff is data dependent at the innermost level, um, for un for other reasons. Yeah, that's too detailed, but um, and so the basically the transformation we need to do is to to pull out these multiple parallel loops to the outer level and merge the innermost loop. So it's in some way it's, it's an interchange and some kind of loop fusion. Okay, and this only works as everything is privatized. Um, so if you're really interested in the details how like the data dependencies work, there's a full impact paper about how to model such kind of like rather complex loop transformation. Um, but that, that's what, what's needed. And so then the interesting thing is what we did is, um, and this is an like one or two year old project um, where we used this after the loop interchange to basically build up a full pipeline. And, and this pipeline goes starting with Fortran and going through LVM and then builds a high level representation of the loop program, does all the transformations, for example, the one I just described, and then generates CUDA code, um, embeds the CUDA code into the binary, and, and then we have a, like a single unified binary with which if everything goes well, we'll run a certain percentage of the program on the GPU, okay? And so I just illustrate a couple of things which we had to use or contribute or work with in LVM. Um, so one thing is that the, which, whoever is writing Fortran front ends for LVM, if there are any flank people, um, we need some intrinsics to actually mod model multidimensional memory accesses. So I want a parametric at element pointer. Uh, we have one, and we don't know if that's the right way, but uh, like if you want to discuss, I would be very interested to discuss. Um, then a lot of the modeling we did, like it was certainly not scalable to, to, to this large kind of sets of loops. So we did some work in like scaling up, up the kind of our model to, to be a little bit more robust for like large programs. And the last thing is that, that the experiments we run use a unified memory. And so I, I saw there were a couple of NVIDIA people which have kernel patches. Um, to, to, to run with unified memory. Uh, yeah, Steve, I think, right? And so we didn't get the kernel patches, so we just hacked together something that, that tries to simulate unified memory. And, and, and yeah, we, we linked the NVIDIA lib device library, and, and this allows us to actually, from the 10% of the Cosmo code, um, basically move all of the computational loops to the device. This is around like 40 to 50 loop kernels running on uh, like different CUDA kernels. And I'm gonna show you briefly some performance numbers just to give you an idea. So this is still work in progress. Um, but also to see like, I don't, did not run with Flank, so maybe we, we see how well Flank is doing. But for, for this test case, we run around 180 seconds, um, just running with Dragon Egg and like LVM from a couple of days ago. Um, LVM is a lot worse in terms of like single spread CPU performance than the Cray compiler, um, which runs around 40 seconds. And what you see here is, is poly ACC with the heterogeneous memory stuff um, gives us 5x speed up over the, the Cray single thread performance and gives us 22x speed up over the LVM compiled performance. This looks a lot. It's actually really bad compared to the manually tuned um, open ACC version where like NVIDIA people and Meteor Swiss people spend a couple of months um, in tuning that stuff. So we lack still around 4.3x to do like really fast GPU code. And a couple of things we have a really good idea about what's missing, other things we, we really don't know yet. So like one of the things is like register usage, LVM uses too many registers and that prevents for example to get us enough parallelism. Um, but the interesting thing is, and then that's kind of like what, what I wanted to show, there are two things. One is that we're really scaling up to, to like non-trivial programs. And the second thing is that at least according to the loop transformations, um, we can do everything right. So we do all this stuff there that, that, that Meteor Swiss was hiring a couple of engineers to do manually, um, fully automatically on that code base. It's still like the, the LVM performance and, and our performance is not optimal. And maybe something is also through the overhead we get through the unified memory. Um, again, I would be interested to, to, to share experiences with that, but, but that's kind of um, what we're looking into. 
Um, yeah, that's about kind of like the, the GPU stuff we are doing and we do based on poly. I now take a little break because I switched to an entirely different topic. So this was to kind of show up like how, how much we can scale those techniques, right? Now we go to a like really boring kernel. Um, but before that, I want to, to just briefly discuss modern C++. And so modern C++, I think, is C++ from 1989. Afterwards, I was told it's called postmodern. Um, but <laughs> um, like one of the things that's still really common in, in, in even postmodern C++ code are expression templates. So if you know, how, if you know TensorFlow and how Eigen are written, um, they use expression templates to avoid temporary memory allocation, right? And so the way expression templates work is that, that you use um, templates to um, express operations. So instead of directly instantiating a certain operation, you just build up a template type of that operation, and then only when you actually as, uh, assign this expression template type to the original type, um, the expression will be evaluated. So this is the first type, part of the expression template, this is the second part, this is actually the expression. And so if you write something like vector ABC, which is summed up, you'll get a nested type of expressions um, that are only evaluated if you assign them to the original non-expression templated type, right? And that's what Icon does today to, to, to generate fast code and to, to avoid all those expressions. And so like one of the very simple questions we asked ourselves is, um, how close can, like this is a rather complex C++ stuff that only really becomes a loop if you do all the inlining and, and all the specialization. Um, but in the end, it's just a loop, right? The computational pattern of, of maybe this vec vector addition is really straightforward. And so like very straightforward pattern is, is DGEM, right? You can write DGEM with a library called Boost Ublas which is kind of one of the first instances of expression templates. It's totally outdated, unoptimized, and slow compared to, to um, a state-of-the-art Eigen implementation, right? But as we are a compiler team, or like a compiler group, um, compilers can do magic. And in this case, it's not actually magic. It's just like a well-known um, algorithm to, to, to do fast matrix multiplication. You use the go-to algorithm. You do L2-level tiling. You do uh, cache register tiling. And the interesting thing is we also need to do some data layer transformations. So you need to save some temporary submatrices um, to, to get some of the last 5 to 10% performance. And the last thing is you need a good cache model and um, a good model of cache latencies. So we added a very like, simple model into LVM um, and then just used an analytical model that's already available. And so just to give you some idea, um, and I was really, so, so the reason was I was actually not thinking this is really scientifically interesting. Um, but I got really annoyed when I wanted to run something on, on like just simple kernels. And I figured out that the gem performance um, for like Boost Ublas with a default LVM optimizations is around nowhere. It's like we get one or two gigaflops out of pos potentially 55, 57, right? And then Polycan could already, since a long time, could do better. We got around like 10% of peak. Um, but we were far away from, from like these optimized vendor libraries. And so basically by just like exploiting LVM to do the inlining for us, um, by, by taking well-known algorithms and, and, and using like established models, but plugging everything together in LVM, um, you can see that we're actually pretty competitive with vendor libraries. I think that's an interesting thing. It's not so much that the LVM infrastructure by itself can do it, but also they leave, you can almost start to transparently optimize this kind of C++ code. Um, hopefully with more than just pattern matching for DGEM. Also thanks to Florian who helped us to fix the ARM code generation to get another like 10 to 20%. And then I wanted to, to briefly talk about compile time because everybody always tells us polyhedral compilation is slow. Um, that's certainly the case in many cases. And one of the, the, the reasons, like one of the areas where we see big compile time slowdown is like if you just have a sequence of gem kernels. And I want to clarify a couple of things. First of all, um, we can, do, can actually split up the compile time increase. And so half of the compile time um, we still spent entirely in LVM. And LVM 
and especially the LVM instruction selection. So we are already with this like 9x slowdown. Most of that slowdown is just because we specialize a lot, we generate more IR, we do more instruction selection, and so stuff becomes slower. The second half of our slowdown, for, for like one of the like slowest benchmarks or like largest slowdown in, in the LVM test suite is actually our own fault. So um, what's interesting to see is that the actual modeling stuff is only a very small percentage. A large part here is the AST generation, where we again, we specialize a lot, we, we, we generate a lot of like very specific runtime checks, and that increases complexity. So that's a part of poly, if you generate very complex checks, we are actually slow. The actual modeling stuff in many cases is not so slow. And that's a, like a common pattern that we see. It's still, even if this large piece would, would disappear, it would still show up at the top of the LVM IR profile in some cases. But in general, we see that the, the, the instruction selection of LVM is dominating. Except for cases where you really over-specialize the, the code and then our code generation itself is getting slow. Um, cool. So now let's move to a third topic, which I think is interesting. So very briefly, we optimized GEM. It's just one instance of how to specialize or like optimize modern C++ code. And now this is one, one of the problems. I'm not sure if anybody is caring about that, um, but I think it's one of the milestones I think I'm very proud of. Um, and this is the last piece of, of, of making polyhedral transformation correct. And so if you see at this loop nest, you certainly see if you want to vectorize this loop nest, what do you need to do to vectorize that thing? Just to get some interactivity here. So what do you need to do to vectorize this stuff? Mike, do you have any idea? Wonderful. Wonderful. So it's a perfect moment for you to, to, to um, yeah, see. Um, so basically what you need to do, the, the dependence scheme is illustrated on the right side. Yep. Um, and what you need to do is you need to run this one away front, right? Then you get parallelism. So if you do this kind of loop transformation, you will see that we have a vector loop here innermost, okay? And so the question is, what is the size of this type? Is it in 32? Or should we base, better use a little bit more? So it doesn't fit in 32 bit because we add n plus m, so that might be 33 bit. And basically, like one of the things we did is we tried to find for each sub-expression the minimal type that we need to be correct, or approximations if we don't need to be correct, or preconditions if we know we cannot be correct, but we still want to be use a very small type, for example, on FPGAs, on GPUs, or something like this. Interestingly, on the LVM test suite, most types are int, so 32 bits, so most of the time we can just approximate and, and this will work. Um, we also see that we get very little compile time overhead in case we don't really need the precise types. And this is kind of a conclusion of some work, like, like I started with the optimistic linearization. Um, we, we did with Johannes together optimistic loop uh, optimization and later this provable correct minimal types. Um, yeah, that's from my side. Yeah. So I zoom in here for you. Would be nice. Okay, not entirely sure how that works, but I, I do the scrolling for you. Okay, I, I'm going into some, some more details into, uh, into LUVM, specifically the wow. pipeline. Um, uh, so the, the uh, different LLVM parses uh, have uh, tend to have different um, optimization goals. For instance, some are contradicting with our uh, analysis we have uh, for the polyhedral modeling. And one of the problems is the Scala dependencies. So if we have uh, start with the code um, as shown on, on the slides, so this, um, this loop is perfectly uh, parallelizable, can be uh, one in parallel. There is um, only a dependency from, from AI to AI, no problem. And can you go next one, because that one doesn't. Yeah. So, and um, uh, what LLVM tends to do, it likes Scala, so that is LLVM value. So it transforms it, um, 
into this code, which in, in PolyV model as like a zero dimensional array. That means there's just one memory location left for this value of TMP and we actually have to use uh, all the value of TMP because we, before we can override with a uh, new value. Uh, do you know which pass in LLVM does this transformation? Yeah, next one please. Yeah, next one. Hmm. Very good. Okay, that's mem to rec which shows this has a dependency from TMP to B. TMP and a un, uh, loop carried uh, false dependency to the next operation. Um, one of the principles of polyhedral optimization is that we analyze it without knowing actually which transformation we can do. So if we would parallelize it, we could easily um, privatize this uh, variable TMP, but before we don't know, since we don't not yet know whether we are parallelizing, we have to uh, assume just the worst. Next one, please. <laughs> yes, a push down button. Um, so next one, so example is loop invariant code motion, which does uh, something very similar. So it tries uh, to move one of the memory accesses before the loop. Next one. Um, and we have the same problem. We have some uh, uh, so-called scalar dependencies between the between uh, the TMP values, such that we cannot parallelize uh, the the or transform the outer for loop any anymore. So this is you know like the name G loop invariant code mission L I C M, which does it, but also G V N does it. Next one. So loop invariant code motion does another pass actually while we are in a loop. It uh, promotes the inner loop, this, the, the value of CI to a register and stay, saves it back afterwards. So uh, this phenomenon is the same. We have introduced a new temporary um, value, an LLVM value, which we model as a zero dimensional way and we can't optimize the outer uh, loop anymore. So, that's, so it's next phenomenon, it's the same, uh, basically the same, speculative execution. We try to move one, we have some common sub-expression elimination here. We move the two x before the if condition, so we have just one instruction in, instead of um, uh, two. And this introduces again our, our dependence, false dependence to the uh, TMP variable. So, skip that one. So, the specific case for GVN load free, again, same problem, um, Scala dependency for a newly introduced LLVM value. So, this one is a bit different. So, there's a loop idiom detection. So this would be something that uh, poly would be able to optimize just as normal. Uh, then loop idiom comes in and introduces a function call. So this specific function uh, for a mem copy, we can do actually model. So we now poly had a model and now see effects of it, but has some other consequences like it changes the, the pointer type it has. Um, and uh, um, it makes it not possible to move the individual copy in uh, the stores and loads anymore. So another specific one, loop rotation. So before we start, like code output by Clang has some uh, CFG, uh, which looks reasonably simple. So we have two nested loops and then the one body, and then we get uh, loop rotation, oh, please. Uh, introduces new basic blocks. So it introduces pre-header and the other one as well. Uh, it also introduces new latches, so which test the exit condition because the exit condition in the pre-header is already tested, also for the other loop. So this is more complicated to model, but still not the, the problem uh, itself. The problem comes when jump threading jumps in. So jump threading sees, oh, there's a condition. If something is not uh, greater than zero, then it's also not greater than 128. So it changes the, the edge and jumps the blocks, the basic block. 
And this has a consequence that suddenly the, uh, the loop for i has, um, has two latches. Uh, so latches are, are basic blocks that have back edges to the, to the uh, loop header. Um, and the problematic thing is that Scala evolution doesn't recognize this as a properly formatted loop anymore because we jump the, the exit condition and Scala evolution expects it to always be tested in each iteration. That is that even loop vectorizer doesn't, is not able to, to vectorize this thing anymore. So yeah, this is short summary, please go on. <laughs> so this, for this reason, so we have the, the LLVM pass line a bit simplified uh, without poly. And by default, until two uh, months ago uh, approximately, we, poly was executed before the, the, all the LLVM mid -M optimization. And it had some conicalization passes because we need to detect loop the anyway, but without the critical uh, passes like loop invariant code motion and GBN. So in about two months ago, we changed it to, um, uh, to be at the end of the mid-end optimization just before the uh, vectorizer, since this is usually the point where the, the loop optimization are supposed to, to be, code has been inline, can be optimized, and so on. So this uh, has following effects. Please, next slide. So uh, we have a an, uh, an, um, benchmark from, which is DL2 from uh, spec 2006. So at the beginning, at the early position, poly could not uh, optimize anything because uh, it, there was no inlining. So th for this benchmark, inlining was crucial. Without inlining, we have function calls, which you cannot optimize. So it did not optimize anything. So when we move it to later, where the loop vectorizer is at the uh, late stage, we can detect more and more loops. But the interesting thing is if we deactivate GVN, LICM, we can even detect more loops with a peak with 80. 86, uh, 87 so-called uh, static control parts that we uh, optimize. So this ideally we want to have, we want to be at the late, it's a stable pipeline where the loop vectorizer are, but without the loop invariant code immersion thing, which is hurts uh, the optimization possibilities. So what we do, uh, instead we try to, let's say undo the transformations done by loop invariant co immersion and, uh, and GVN. Uh, this is an example which for which we have the lifetimes uh, model. So we have a lifetime graph for uh, for each execution step for C and for C as large capital C as well. Uh, for the the lifetime for C is shown there. And we also have lifetimes for the array capital C. Um, next one, please. <laughs> so what we can see actually is that we can, we have some unused uh, space in the array C, so we can map just the Scala C into there. Next one. So the obvi obvious uh, possibility is just to have, uh, uh, put them all in N one array in, uh, in C2, but there is no advantage doing here. We have still the same Scala uh, dependency here. Uh, next one, please. If, if instead we move, have uh, put them each in its own um, array and we, we execute the mapping uh, CI, we can actually remove some of the, the uh, instructions there and get actually by something that is uh, very optimizer by, uh, by the, by poly and poly modeling. So next one experience. So this is shows, um, we show the, this is the effect when we run poly at the early position where it's used to be and we move it later to the loop vectorizer. Suddenly all the performance difference is gone. So poly doesn't do anything. If you do this delicum, this undoing of loop in and code motion, uh, we suddenly gain the, uh, the original performance uh, almost everywhere. 
Uh, in addition, we have the uh, benchmarks, uh, the ones with UBLAS, with suddenly, which we could not optimize before because inlining was missing, and we can now optimize because inlining happened and we can undo all the, the bad loop invariant code motion and GV and stuff. So next, let's jump that one. So there, there's another example, so another benchmark from SpecCPU 2006. Uh, HMMER, which has uh, already been analyzed two years ago at this conference by uh, uh, Gerolf. Hoff, sorry, I don't remember. Gerolf. Gerolf. <laughs> <laughs> so the problem is here, this one, it's, it's a hot loop in there. And next slide, please. Uh, there's one problem. There is one uh, um, distance one dependency. This means because of this dependency, this loop cannot be optimized. Uh, thing is, but these, this loop consists of three independent parts. So the, f the first one is perfectly vectorizable, the middle one as discussed is not, and uh, the last one is vectorizable uh, as well. So ideally we, um, we want uh, to do loop distribution such that the, the vectorizable loops are distributed and only the one that's not uh, vectorizable stays as it is. So the work by uh, Gerolf, uh, he introduced um, a loop distribution path, which does this optimization. So it extracts out the first one, which can be vectorized, but it puts the, the, um, uh, the second part together, uh, which still cannot be vectorized. So, but there's a dash initial switch, uh, which called loop distribute if, non if convertible, which makes our three loops which is what we uh, want to do. Unfortunately, um, the loop vectorizer will do some if conversion there, so there's some conditions there um, on when the middle part is executed. So what we did in poly is in uh, this, this was what poly used to do. So uh, it puts base, understands one basic block as atomic, um, statement, so it cannot uh, separate them. Uh, and there are two basic blocks, so we have two statements. So we introduced some uh, splitting of these basic blocks, similar to the algorithm of loop distribution, uh, such that also the upper loop can be uh, is uh, split into two parts. Then we run the poly uh, um, uh, scheduler, which will sh uh, introduce the following thing, which will do the, the loop distribution because loops do not have anything in common. So it makes, next slide please, it uh, makes two, uh, three loops of it. And this uh, interesting thing is, is here that um, for the last loop, it uh, just strips off the, the last iteration since it's conditioned out, so we have the loop vectorizer in this example does not do, do need any, any um, uh, uh, if conversion here. So in the experiments show the, the following. So compared to um, uh, O3 with, with poly and this uh, splitting of basic blocks, we get the best performance, which is about 80% uh, better than the plane O3 performance. The uh, um, loop distribute pass also gains some perf uh, performance gain, but not as much. Uh, one of the reason is uh, yeah the if conversion which is necessary, and uh, I, I'm not sure whether that explains the, the complete difference, but uh, I, I, this at least is one of the reason why with poly this optimization poly is the fastest here. So. I thank you. So this is everything for me. So chapter summary, and I have a global summary for all the stuff we talked about. I would love your questions if there's time. Yeah. Also, like one thing we should say, like as I said, like we presented this here as two people, but like as a, the very first slide, like there are a lot of people worked on poly, like a lot of the the ideas came from like different research papers, like some of the stuff like like were prototyped by by like Johannes did some some prototypes. He did a lot of like core implementation, so there's a lot of um, like people involved with just two people standing here. So um, just that needs to be said. Yeah, any, any questions? Uh, the question is, uh, does today's poly has a 
uh, have good uh, cost model because it, it looks to me you actually uh, add a lot of- First, what are you talking about? Uh, I'm talking about the, the, you know, you, you have the benchmark, I mean, couple benchmark, you actually yeah, add a bunch one? of the options. Uh, yes, before example, you need to add the scalar independent uh, and the enable loop distribution. Yeah. Is uh, you uh, the basically is a, is a, you need to use a provide this option to enable those transformations. This is a loop distribution is disabled by default, it's, uh, uh, default. because they're, they're, because they're, the argument is we, they, it also gives you some some regression, so it's not universal in um, universally uh, beneficial. Uh, to loop distribute, so it's disabled by default. You can only enable it if you add the Parkman tackling specifically to distribute this loop. Yeah, this is, this is my general uh, kinds of question. Is today is uh, actually probably uh, is a have a you know good so, so you uh, customer about itself, right? and, uh, Yes, yes. So yeah, yeah. so so like um, <clears throat> yes and no. Um, so we have like like for example for the gem optimization, I think we have a like like almost perfect analytical model. Uh, which didn't come from us, but there's like there's an actual analytical model where you can, based on cache sizes and, and instruction latencies, actually derive the exactly the correct uh, register size, tile sizes, cache tile sizes, and then all that stuff. Um, but but like for large parts of poly, like this is one where we I would say we have an end-to-end -end perfect model, and for other parts we have heuristics and we have like ILP-based optimizers that 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 that. Um, have good tendencies for optimization. So, we, for example, we can, can, can try to increase data, data locality, we can try to expose parallelism if we want to parallelize, or for the GPU, for example. Um, there are new patches to, to actually um, model uh, spatial locality, uh, which we didn't have until, until today, but we have like a new set of patches to, to start modeling spatial locality. Um, but as you just realize, like we have some components, but we don't have a complete performance model. And, and some like some of the, the, the optimizations, yeah, you need to enable a couple of special flags to make them happen. So one of the things I'd like to see in general is, is um, finding ways to, 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 to yeah, to, to actually make those performance models more solid. So it's making poly flags, default flags more solid, but also like actually um, developing performance, loop optimization performance models. And some of this is useful for poly, but, but as we saw like the LVM loop distribution part itself, does not have a performance model that's good enough to enable it by default. And so I think even inside or outside of poly, I think we need more work and more benchmarks um, to, to, to actually find good performance models that, that some of those parts can be enabled by default. Uh, <clears throat> thanks for the call, uh, thanks for the talk. One question I have is about the uh, position of poly inside the pipeline. So you argued that you need the inliner to run to get rid of calls, which is what's the main argument in this in this talk. Why you want to run late, and but then you had to handle all these cases with all the analyses and all the optimizations that basically screw up your input, and then you kind of make it whole again and try to try to be a clickable anyway. So my question is, what else do you gain except the calls? If is there anything? Because you also lose more than just uh, the things you've shown, for example, the inliner will now inline based on the size that it sees, but you actually, a poly most of the time has to do versioning. Versioning means doubling code size of certain portions of the code, which would cause the inliner maybe not to inline things. At the same time, your inliner uh, optimizable loop nest into multiple places and you run poly multiple times, which is probably like poly is cost like compile time intensive anyway you put it so you run it multiple times now instead of one time in the beginning and so on and so forth so what 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 is uh, what is the reasoning here why to put it late so we, we have usually four four reasons so we first first maybe we don't run one poly so the difference is running it uh, at the beginning and at the end but just once so uh, one, so second, besides the inlining, the second reason is that we have uh, lots of canonicalization passes in addition to uh, the LLVM mid-end. So this one redundantly. Uh, and so, so if poly does not do anything, which is the case for, for most of the loops, then we increase the comp compile time because we, these additional passes 
one twice, so may, or more often as necessary. Another consequence is, is that running these additional passes, they modify the code in some non less more stable uh, uh, fixed point or so when they run. So the, the, if we add these additional passes in front, we modify the AR and the performance will be different at the end, even if we uh, poly did not do anything. So uh, that might be, it's not directly the fault of poly, but when it starts when an, uh, it's, it's an effect when enabling poly, and so we wanted to avoid if poly does not do anything, then we don't have any change in, in uh, performance, even, even if it's better. Uh, fourth reason, I mentioned another one. I forgot. <laughs> There's one other question. The two actually. the fourth one. We run out of time, so I guess you can catch oh. up offline yeah. with them. Chat with us here. Thank you, guys. Ah. Thank you.